For those of you who don't know me, I'm Gina Menger. I'm the SLIM director here in Portland, Oregon. Um, and welcome. We wanted to set this up for American Archives Month um, to celebrate all of the archivists and archivists-to-be that we have in the SLIM program. Here in Portland, we would probably be doing an archives crawl this weekend, but you know, with the pandemic, that's canceled. So we decided we would try and do something um, that would give our students an opportunity to talk to some practicing archivists and um, get to know each other a little bit better. So welcome everyone. Um, I would like to now turn it over to our Dean, Dr. Wusab Jung, who has a few words he'd like to share with you. Good evening. Thank you for participating in this wonderful event. And I particularly uh, uh, very appreciate the uh, instructors, I have to say instructors, the, those uh, who will uh, present their experiences and um, other tips to our students from the field. I really, really appreciate your time. Um, and uh, Gina, it's a brilliant idea. You know, Gina suggested, uh, what about this, you know, meeting online and then uh, okay, uh, we, we um, never ever kind of thought about this kind of thing and then why not? So uh, it, it was about two weeks time frame from the beginning to this moment. It was very quick. And as you see, we have many uh, directors are uh, here as well to support uh, this great event. And, and I'm not an uh, archivist at all. I don't have any backgrounds. Uh, but I know it's not, uh, it, it's more than a, a old, old books. <laughs> so that, that, that's for sure. And, and the many you know, other kind of utilities of values uh, in many places from city, you know, county or uh, big or small companies, the archives is very important. And so, and also uh, from uh, the professions, the realistic, you know, uh, it's not about touching, you know, 500 year old paper now. <laughs> so, and then what about the job prospects? You know, there are jobs, I believe, then uh, what kind of skills and the technical skills or mind kind of, you know, uh, mental skills, what kinds of skills uh, do we need uh, uh, for our students? So I'm, I'm very glad uh, to have this event. And, and I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight experts in this field tonight. Uh, and I, I know only two people, the Ashley and Steve, because they have taught uh, classes for us, uh, but I uh, will get to know each of you. Uh, and then students, welcome to this wonderful uh, uh, event. I hope you have a great time with these experts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna just uh, read, read you a brief bio for all of our guest speakers. And then when I'm done with that, I'm gonna turn it over to them to give you, um, you know, the 90 second version of what their organization is and who their constituents are, who uses their archive, what kind of materials they have in there. Um, so I'm just gonna do this in alphabetical order. So our first guest archivist is Jonathan Bingham. Is the historian and archivist with the 75th Air Base Wing History Office at Hill Air Force Base in Northern Utah. He received his MLS from the SLIM Utah cohort and has a BA in history and German from the University of Utah. But thank you for being here, Jonathan. Uh, Samantha Bradbeer is the historian for the Hallmark Archives in Kansas City, Missouri. Samantha is a certified archivist and received her MA in Museum Studies from the John Hopkins University and her BA in Anthropology from the University of Kansas. Steve Duckworth is the University Archivist for Oregon Health and Science University's Historical Collections and Archives in Portland, Oregon. Currently, he is also serving as the Interim Director of Special Collections. Steve holds an MLIS from Drexel University and a Digital Archives Specialist Certificate from the Society of American Archivists and is a member of SLIM's National Adjunct Faculty. Brian Johnson is the Archives and Records Management Coordinator at the City of Portland's Portland Archives and Records Center. 
Brian is a certified archivist and received his MLS from the Slim Oregon cohort and his BA in history and anthropology from Linfield University in McMinnville, Oregon. Becky Geller is a preservation specialist for the Northeast Document Conservation Center in Andover, Massachusetts. She earned her MLS from the Slim Colorado cohort and her bachelor's degree in art history, criticism and conservation from Colorado College in Colorado Springs. And then David Matt, I'm not sure if he's joined us yet, but he is the state archivist of the Idaho State Archives and also serves on the leadership team of the Idaho State Historical Society. And Dr. Ashley Todd Diaz is the Assistant University Librarian for Special Collections and University Archives at Towson University in Towson, Maryland. She received her PhD in Library and Information Science from Emporia State University and is a member of SLIM's National Adjunct Faculty. Then Dr. David Ware is State Historian and Director of the Arkansas State Archives in Little Rock, Arkansas. Dr. Ware earned a PhD in U.S. History from Arizona State University, an MA in History from the University of Wyoming, and a BA in French Literature from the University of Nebraska. So thank you all for being here um, and answering the call that we made in the last couple of weeks to come and talk to our students. I would like now to turn it over to you um, to give us a brief overview. Hello? Hello, David? Hello? Did everybody yeah. did everybody lose their signal? No, I don't Actually, think so. You were disconnected for a minute, David. It looks yeah. like you're reconnected Sorry. now, but no no video yet. So well, and it's it's perfect timing because I was just going to go in reverse alphabetical order and ask you okay. if you would like to take a few minutes to tell our students about your organization and like who your constituents are, what's in your archives, and anything else interesting about um, where you work. Okay. Well, I'm the since January, I've been the director of the Arkansas State Archives, which for most of its more than hundred year life uh, time went under the moniker of the Arkansas History Commission which was created, it was created back in the early years of the 20th century to preserve and reprint historical documents and other historical things. It had an ill-defined collection. After a few years of operation with no staff, they acquired an ABD from the University of Chicago named Alice Herndon, who came on board with no salary. Um, eventually they found money for him. He stayed for 40 years as our first director. And what he did was he started ferreting out um, as many early documents of Arkansas history as possible. Um, he was aided in this by a, a gifted eccentric collector who had cleaned out, literally cleaned out the basement of the old um, state capitol and had salvaged anything that looked like it had a neat signature or a seal on it. You know, per perfectly sound way to collect government documents. Um, Ar Arkansas, unlike most of the states, is not a records management state. That is, every state agency, department, county, municipal government, they are responsible for doing whatever the heck they want with their own records. And so the Arkansas State Archives or History Commission has grown up to be a rather interesting um, broad field special, special collection library. We have government documents, um, early government documents. Uh, we also have large collections dealing with various governors. Uh, we have a wide assortment of, of community organization, county, county government level records, even municipal records. And today I was offered um, the records of a funeral home out in the northeastern part of the state uh, to supplement the somewhat scattered holdings of our state's division of vital records. Um, they hold the records. We have the notebooks that provide the index to the records. If that tells you something about archives in Arkansas, well, <laughs> lead on, there's more. Um, at any rate, we have three locations. I have 26 employees um, scattered. We have a, two regional archives, one in the southwest part of the state, one in the northwest par part of the portion of the state in the area that some of us call Baja, Missouri. Um, we have funding primarily from the general, the, the general appropriations from the legislature. We supplement that with a, with a grant program um, we and other state agencies basically compete for money to actually do the little things like buy, buy scanners or 
undertake big digitization projects. Um, we maintain a large microfilming operation still because, well, microfilm, if you, if you want stuff to last, um, it's simple, it's direct. All you have to do is do it right and keep it cool <laughs> and not mess with it and it'll last literally for centuries. And so we have the largest collection in the country of Arkansas cereals, newspapers and magazines, um, as well as other, other um, publications. And we serve about 3,000 walk-in clients a year. Of course, well, COVID may have made a difference, but we have a growing web presence and we act as advisors to county and local governments, as well as to state agencies, helping them come to grips with the challenge of not just not just throwing away their records, for goodness sakes, but actually figuring out records retention schedules um, that will satisfy their needs and also the needs of history. It's a roving commission and it's a lot of fun and it's kind of bewildering. But hey, so far so good. <laughs> Thanks. That sounds uh, fascinating. I mean, I, the fact that there's no statewide organization of records is kind of mind boggling, but there you go. Uh, that's the nice way of putting it. <laughs> um, I came from why I came here um, after having lived for years up in Wyoming, where this, there's this giant warehouse on the edge of Cheyenne, and that's where state records go. And there's no question about it. There's no debate. It's not, no, no you can't have these. There are. So they hmm. simply go there. We're working toward it. It's fascinating. Um, we're working toward it. <laughs> well, thanks. Um, let's see. I said reverse alphabetical order, didn't I? That would mean that um, Ashley Todd Diaz is next. Ashley, you wanna tell us about your archive? Sure. Um, so I work at Towson University and we are a special collections and university archives department. So we handle all of the university records as well as kind of a handful of specific collecting areas. So because Towson, much like Emporia, started off as a normal school. We have a collecting area in the history of education in Maryland. Um, we merged with a university about 10 years ago that focused on Jewish studies. So Jewish studies um, is another one of our collecting areas as well as World War II and performing arts. So a little bit of everything. Um, and we do have a few thousand rare books as well. Um, so. I would say our primary patrons are the university community. So a lot of um, college to so undergraduate and graduate students coming in to do research or have instruction sessions. Um, some faculty conducting research, um, retired faculty, and then community members. Um, I have no idea how many people <laughs> come in on the course of a, a typical semester. Um, I would probably say a few hundred, um, but I've actually just wrapped up a survey of our student body to see how many people actually are aware of the archives um, because we are kind of, we're on the top floor of the library and kind of tucked away. Um, so we are doing more to, to kind of broaden our reach. But yeah, that's our archives in a nutshell. Jenna, you're muted. Oh, sorry. I knew it was going to happen at some point. So there you go. So next would be um, David Matt from the state Idaho State Archives. Well, thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. I hope everyone's doing well. Well, I work at the Idaho State Archives, uh, which is a subdivision of the parent organization, the Idaho State Historical Society. And we're one of several divisions under that state agency. Uh, the State Museum is another division as is the State Historic Preservation Office. And we have historic sites around the state. Uh, the State Archives also uh, has a record center function here in the state. Uh, we're a very small staff of 13 people. And uh, we uh, collect, uh, preserve, and provide access to uh, the state records. We have over 150,000 cubic feet of records here at the State Archives, and about 35,000 cubic feet of records managed under the State uh, Records Center. Um, we 
are open. We have a research center. We're open Tuesday through Saturday for the public to come in. Uh, of course, our numbers are are down and we sort of have protocols in place because of COVID-19 to, to make sure we keep those numbers um, down in terms of uh, foot traffic. But like a lot of research libraries and archives, uh, we've seen um, probably equal amount of reference service that's delivered uh, remotely via uh, staff working with people uh, through uh, email and, and other ways to, to deliver research to, uh, to the staff, uh, from the staff to, our, to the public. Uh, we also have a permanent exhibit here. It's called the Lincoln Legacy Exhibit, which was donated by uh, former Lieutenant Governor and Attorney General David Leroy, who is uh, considered one of the uh, Lincoln scholars here in the state of Idaho and longtime collector. And uh, he donated his collection to the Historic Society in 2017. And we basically converted a bunch of study carols that weren't being used and uh, turned it into a five room uh, permanent exhibit which tells the story of uh, President Lincoln's administration and the connection to Idaho. He did sign the Territorial Act that created uh, uh, the territory from which uh, the state of Idaho and parts of Montana were uh, created from. Uh, so we, in terms of our audience, um, we, we serve a wide audience. We serve, of course, uh, the general public who's interested in history for a number of reasons, uh, people doing genealogy research or uh, other types of historical research. We, of course, serve state government, uh, people who uh, need their records uh, for various uh, uh, issues they might be working on. Uh, legislators uh, often uh, will turn to us for uh, research that the staff need to assist with or the executive and judicial branches of uh, state government. So our, our audience is pretty wide. Uh, one of the, uh, being under the historic study, uh, one of the things we engage a lot in is uh, educational outreach. And uh, this next year we're uh, one of the big things we'll be celebrating is the 140th anniversary of uh, the agency. It was sort of created as a state agency in 1908, but prior to that, it was un, um, sort of evolved out of a pioneers group. So uh, we, we often will have uh, events such as that, that we uh, serve as the uh, individuals to provide content for educational um, endeavors that the agency undertakes. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I spent several years in Idaho and Boise and have many fond memories of the Idaho Historical Society. So I'm really glad that you could be here with us today. Thank you, my pleasure. Um, so next would be Becky Geller. Hi everyone, um, so I'm Becky Geller and I am a preservation specialist at the Northeast Document Conservation Center. We are trying really hard to start going by our acronym, um, which is still not that easy to say, NEDCC. And what NEDCC does is uh, it's a nonprofit center for conservation, uh, preservation and related services. So, oh, sorry, my cat is might join us as well. Um, so we, uh, and I'm in the preservation services department, uh, but before I get to what we do, I'll talk about what con like our conservation services and all of that. We do paper and book and photo conservation. We also have an Asian art conservation component. Um, and then associated with that, we have really, um, really wonderful high-tech digital imaging services. And we have super cool high-tech audio preservation services as well, uh, doing a lot of magnetic media, uh, no surprise there. But we also have Irene technology, which does, which allows for the reformatting of grooved media um, without, which is a touchless technology using lasers, or I should say high resolution, resolution images that turns the grooves um, images of the grooves uh, through an algorithm back into sound so you can get uh, the content off of grooved media and it's very cool. Um, make sure I'm not missing any of the other departments. So I think that brings me to preservation services, which is where I work. And um, even though I got my job because I have my MLS from SLIM, uh, the Denver cohort, um, and I'm a certified archivist, I do not work as an archivist. So actually our clients are archives, museums, libraries, any cultural heritage institutions and organizations. So we also work with historical societies, uh, universities, town clerks, city clerks, all of that sort of thing. And we provide preservation education and outreach and assessment. A big part of my job is doing assessments 
um, out in the field nationwide, helping people establish preservation programs. Also getting access to grant funding to, uh, to fund those sorts of projects. I do a lot of education through webinars and online courses, doing that a lot right now since I'm working from home. And what else do I do? Oh, and we provide disaster recovery support as far as getting connecting people to resources. So we are uh, before people started coming on, uh, David Willis was talking about the fires in Colorado. So I actually had a phone call with someone in Granby um, about dealing with the smoke and collections and helping them get the resources and information they need to be able to recover from that and try to prevent as much damage as possible before that starts. So that's another part of my job. Um, and I think that wraps it up for me. I'm probably forgetting something, but yeah. Oh, it'll probably come up later. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Brian Johnson. Uh, I, I am at the city of Portland, Oregon, that is archives and records management program. We're a combined program of archives and records management for the city. Um, so we deal with the active and inactive, so the historical and uh, everything in between. So our system that we oversee, uh, commissioners uh, on a day -to daily basis drop materials in that and that same, same system we catalog an old photo or an old um, volume or document into. Um, there are seven of us at uh, full timers there, and then we have an assortment of, uh, well, in non COVID times, we have assortment of volunteers, interns, um, and part time workers. Um, we are not on site for the most part now, and we're doing reference pretty much digitally at this point. So if people can find specific things thereafter, we'll digitize it and send it out. And that's kind of the way we're doing it. For the foreseeable future, I'm not sure when we're gonna go back. Our constituents, probably if I had to guess, 40, 50% students were located on the Portland State University campus. Uh, so it's pretty easy for them to get to us, but we have students from all over, mainly Oregon, Washington. Um, and the public is a larger, starting to become a larger part, uh, I think, thanks to our outreach efforts. So maybe a third there. And city employees on site are probably only about five to 10% of the people we serve, but um, we do more for, the, for them digit, so digitally and they, use, they can tap into our system and find things that way. Great, thanks. I remember uh, the Portland Archives and Records Center was one of the first organizations I visited when I joined SLIM as the director, and Brian was one of the first archivists I ever met. So thank you for being here. Pleasure. Um, Samantha Bradbeer, oh wait, sorry, alphabetical. That would be Steve Duckworth. Uh, hi, um, so I'm the University Archivist and Interim Director of Special Collections at Oregon Health and Science University, also in Portland. Hi, Brian. Um, we are kind of your typical university archives, just a very small, well, relatively small, um, and very focused on health sciences. So medicine, nursing, public health, dentistry, for the most part. Um, we, I'm the only archivist uh, where I am. Um, we have uh, what we would call a paraprofessional who uh, does a lot of our reference services. And then I oversee two student uh, employees and they're both grad students in uh, library science programs as well. Um, we have uh, all sorts of university records and um, paper collections, uh, as well as digital materials from various uh, health science organizations or um, you know, practicing doctors, nurses, et cetera, in the Pacific Northwest. We have uh, over, I think over 4,000 rare books uh, or close to rare, uh, something like over 3,000 medical artifacts. Um, and that's pretty much all of our stuff. Uh, our main constituent is probably our own communications department, actually. Um, given the clinical nature of the curriculum where we are, we don't actually have many students come in because they are busy learning how to save lives and not 
how we learned how to save lives. Um, so we don't have that many students come in. Uh, so we have a lot of medical historians that come and do research and we have a lot of marketing that likes old photographs, which I think is pretty typical for university archives as well. Probably everywhere really. Uh, I think that's about it. Thanks. So then that would bring us to Samantha Bradbeer. Hey everyone, I'm Samantha. I work in the Hallmark Archives, which is located in Hallmark Cards Worldwide Headquarters, located in Kansas City, Missouri. It's a privately held family owned company that creates personal expression project products. So greeting cards, gift wrap, home decor, ornaments, and other gifts that you would send for celebrations. And those products are sold in more than 40,000 retail stores across the US and in over 100 countries, including, of course, online. But the collections housed in the Hallmark archives were formed under Hallmark founder JC Hall's vision. He was really interested in creating an accurate and varied record of the greeting card industry and then following that his own company and family history. So our main focus is really providing access to employees, business partners, and special guests so that they can learn about our company's history, our products history, and innovations, as well as have the opportunity to do research for product developments. A lot of artists and writers in-house will use the collection as a resource to create products for today's marketplace. So anytime you've ever been in a a card shop walking down the greeting card aisle and seeing something that looks a little vintage or nostalgic inspired it's because it is it's based off something in the archives and so i have a lot of help um, with the product development teams pulling content based on their requests their needs uh, sharing stories about our past and we'll share that on the packaging in fact i've been doing a lot more product development than i ever thought um, coming into this role uh, so I have some exciting products coming out next year that are entirely created by um, assets in the archives. But in addition to being used for our employees and business partners for products and inspiration, we also do allow consumers, fans of the company, to learn more about our collections, our history. So I'm constantly answering research requests, um, installing exhibits at the Hallmark Visitor Center, which is open to the public. It's currently closed due to COVID. Um, and attending conventions like New York Comic Con and San Diego Comic Con and smaller ones. So that way they can learn about our company history, especially in regards to pop culture. We've had so many partnerships over the years with famous artists from Walt Disney to Charles Schultz, Norman Rockwell, Winston Churchill, and so many others that there's a lot of overlap where consumers, fans of the company or museums across the country are interested in learning more about our collections. So we share that whenever possible. With that being said, I wear a lot of hats. Um, my official title is historian, but I am the company archivist and basically anything and everything to do with storytelling and heritage. I'm the person that you need to contact. And it's just me. I'm a lone arranger. I'm the only one in my department right now. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to grow in the future, especially since it's not just focused on Hallmark's history in the United States. It's also a global company. And so I answer research requests from around the world and, and try to share our story worldwide. Thanks, that sounds fascinating. Um, and then we're back up to the top of the list. So Jonathan, or John, if you prefer. Hey. Uh, I go by John. Hopefully you can understand me. My internet is really struggling tonight. So hopefully I'm not too broken up. You sound uh, good. If you, if you want to turn your camera off and just use the audio, that works too. Okay. Maybe, maybe I'll try that in a minute here. Um, but yeah, so my position, I like Samantha, it sounds like um, a lot of similarities. I, I'm, my title's technically historian, but I manage um, an archive and uh, I'm the only one in the office. I actually am on the uh, Air Base Wing Commander's staff. So um, I'm paid by the Air Force and um, <clears throat> my job is to really support 
the commander and his subordinate commanders to improve mission readiness. So, uh, I'm an advisor and I, I use the archives that I managed to provide information to the commanders for their decision making. Basically, they'll ask questions about the history of installation that I, I will in reports that um, are in the archive. We have photos, lots of people ask me for uh, historical photo, nice heritage displays or hang on the wall. And so um, my friends too, I have the information sign almost like a, a reference librarian would in special collections. I don't know if we lost John altogether or it was just a lag. Let's see. I think we lost him all together. Hopefully he'll come back. <laughs> okay, well, the next bit um, is really time for you students to ask any questions that you have. So we can do this a couple of ways. Um, you can always enter questions in the chat box, if you like. Um, David Willis from Colorado is going to help monitor the chat box, but you're also free to um, ask, you know, unmute yourself and ask questions live, so to speak. If you want to use the um, reactions, if you can find those on your control bar and, you know, clap or cry or you know, be surprised or whatever, uh, just to let us know that you have a question. And then um, we can, you know, go ahead and unmute you and handle it that way. So I guess if anybody has a question right out of the gate that you want to ask, Carrie has a question. Carrie, why don't you go ahead, unmute yourself. And, and when you ask the question, just introduce yourself and where you are. So everyone can kind of know what part of the country you're in. Yeah, um, so I'm Carrie Stotts and I am in the SLIM cohort in Portland. Um, this is my first semester. So this is all very new to me. I um, decided I wanted to go into library science initially to be a children's librarian. Um, I had never even heard of an archivist until earlier this year when I went to a, a panel of Portland Slim alumni. So, um, and I just thought it was so intriguing. So um, it's been nice to hear from all of you. Um, my question is, um, a few of you touched on the role of community engagement in your jobs. And I just wonder if you could maybe, um, you know, those of you that, that have that in your job, if you could maybe elaborate on that and kind of just what that looks like and what you, what you do with community engagement. Who would like to, Samantha, you want to start? <laughs> sure. Um, mine's probably the least engaging since we are a privately held company. Uh, but as I mentioned, I go to conventions where I meet the public a lot, or I'm at the physically at the Hallmark Visitor Center. And so I'm doing tours. I'm providing presentations that are specific to a topic, you know, maybe working on a panel or maybe it's just me. Um, but whenever I'm at those types of events, people will come up to me and ask me, you know, hey, I collect Hallmark cards or I have Hallmark ornaments from 30, 40, 50 years ago, and they want to know more about their collections. Um, so I'll follow up, you know, just similar to a research request uh, with them personally, but they also want to know how to protect their collections. Um, so giving them some preservation strategies on how to best store those cards and ornaments so that way they can, you know, have them for future generations, I would say has become more and more common um, as questions that I've received from the, from the public, from the community. Uh, but I also do partner a lot with other museums across the country to share my collections and they'll invite me out and uh, I'll do presentations there and meet with the public there as well. So even though I'm in a private business, I am still engaging with the community, uh, whether it's through presentations or just answering research requests. 
Yeah, for us at the City of Portland Archives, we do a lot of community engagement. Uh, Gina mentioned the, or I think Gina mentioned the archives crawl. So that's been a big thing for us for a decade or so now. And that brings together about 30 to 35 different archival organizations. And we meet, we started meeting in four locations and now it's three and archives that aren't located there get a table and they can bring materials. So that's a big one in the Portland area. Um, for us specifically, we, uh, we use opportunities from, that come oftentimes from our research room to work with people, um, work with community groups. Um, we actually are helping three different community-based groups that have archival records right now store them because we have some extra space. And uh, until they can figure out where they want to house their materials, um, and we still have space, we're we're providing that as well. Um, we've produced materials that uh, we give out at the archives crawl and other events that are kind of uh, um, described to the community what types of materials we have that could benefit them, because a lot of the time people don't think the city archives really has anything to do with their sort of daily lives or things that can help them. Um, so we have those and uh, we have an artist in residence program and that's been one of the biggest uh, community outreach things for us uh, in that it's a local artist or team of artists who uh, go out into the community and, and use archival materials to sort of illustrate um, their projects. So they actually go out into their community or communities uh, in general and do exhibits or do discussions and uh, they use our materials to illustrate those and to get ideas for those. So that's been a pretty kind of unique and a, a big one for us. Anybody else have anything to add to Carrie's question? David does. Yeah. Um, because we're kind of, we're, we're sort of, we're sort, we're sort of a, a, a mystery to a lot of people, a lot of community outreach, a lot of programming is what we normally do, except of course this year when all bets have been off. Um, so our, a couple of, a couple of our staff members have uh, been doing engagement with various community groups and other things through social media, essentially going into territory that not many of us know all that well, but we have, we have um, outreach programs, we, had, we used to do a tra the traveling archivist, basically going around giving consultations. Uh, we, li we liaise with other groups within the state, the Historical Association, the, the State Library Association, the State Museums Association. Um, we realized that we are kind of a, myst a mystery, uh, sort, sort of a state orphan. On the other hand, we have things, we have material that um, people are interested in, not just genealogists, and so the community engagement has to be ongoing with us or else uh, we, we, lose, we lose our audience. So when, when we're not quarantining, we're pretty darn good at it. <laughs> I can add to that as well. Um, at Towson, I think a lot of what we do focuses around instruction and in introducing different groups to um, as David was saying, what an archives is and how they can embrace that and own that themselves. So we work with a lot of K-12 um, classes and introduce different types of materials to them. If they can't come to us, then we will bring things to them. Um, so as I mentioned, we have a, a number of rare books and a number of them are, they lived through the Holocaust. Um, so they were either hidden from the Nazis or stolen um, by the Nazis. And so they have many different types of stamps and marks that they received throughout the course of the war. So we bring those out to classes to talk to them about kind of the people who are no longer with us and the books that are left behind as markers of who they were in the communities um, that no longer exist based on reading the stamps and the markings that are in these books. Um, we also work with retirement communities. Um, there's a, a large Jewish community in Baltimore. So reaching out to Holocaust survivors and, um, and 
building um, opportunities to speak with them and reconnect them to other parts of the community. So there's a, a strong focus at our university in connecting with the community as much as we can. So um, it is a, a focus, but sometimes a challenging one if people don't know that you exist. <laughs> Does anybody have anything else to add for this question? Uh, yeah, I would like to just uh, talk about here in Idaho. Uh, I mentioned, you know, we're part of the Idaho State of Stroke Studies. So uh, we partner with our colleagues over at the State Museum with Education Outreach. And one of the things that we really try to make sure that we align with is the governor's priorities and education is uh, certainly at the top of his list. So. Um, we did that uh, before uh, Governor Little was elected, and, but uh, this certainly we make sure that uh, we are always aligning with what the governor's priorities are. Um, education, of course, as I mentioned, is a top one. And so we're um, working all the time to, um, of course, under COVID, it's, it's different in terms of bringing people into the buildings, but uh, we do the National History Day and the, they have education specialists at the, at the State Museum that we partner with. As I mentioned earlier, you know, we provide a lot of content for a lot of the programming. Uh, so here at the archives, we are uh, trying to develop a lecture series, of course, COVID, uh, that's probably not going to happen uh, anytime soon, but to try to uh, bring uh, people in to talk about important uh, topics of today and use history as a lens to uh, examine and have uh, deep conversations about, about that and show how important it is to uh, collect uh, history and to be able to present uh, different points of view on that in a uh, respectful, safe environment. So that's something that uh, we work on and we really are a resource for uh, a lot of the education efforts uh, that this agency undertakes uh, across the state. And we do go out and speak to uh, like uh, when the Association of Idaho Counties, for example, uh, there's 44 counties in Idaho and they meet uh, couple times a year under normal circumstances and we would be invited to go there and speak about and promote uh, the importance of collecting uh, county records uh, that hopefully eventually some would come to the archives. So we're, we're always advocating for the archives and, and really uh, being advocates for uh, being able to, how important it is to teach historical literacy that, uh, you know, archives have a critical role in that. So um, that's uh, sort of the framework of our, our outreach here in Idaho. Great, so I know that there have been several questions coming through chat. David, do you wanna um, tee up one, or yeah. one of those questions for us? Yeah, I'll just relay them in the order that they've come in. So we had a question, how important is a history degree to managing a historical archive? Do you need a business degree to manage a corporate archive effectively, et cetera? Um, I guess they're just wondering about it your backgrounds in education and whether you feel like um, that's critical to lining up with whatever archive you happen to be working in. I'm happy I'll to start. To oh, go, go ahead. ahead. All right, thanks. Um, I was just going to say, no, you do not need to have a business degree to work in a business or a corporate archive. In fact, I don't know anyone that does, um, and I'm in a lot of professional development groups, uh, business archives specific sections. In fact, it's one of the most varied, I feel like. Um, so many people have different degrees, different backgrounds, um, you know, from library science to museum studies to history degrees, um, degrees in public affairs and communications. It's kind of all over the board. Um, so I don't think you would need to have specifically, you know, a certain type of degree to get into the field if you'd want to work in a business archive. Although a lot of the preferred qualifications, though, do have library science and a um, certified archivist uh, listed uh, in, in those qualifications. I think more having a well-rounded background, um, you know, working in a variety of different types of institutions will help you a lot. In a business archive setting, I worked or volunteered in archives, libraries, museums, archeological research centers, 
um, historical societies all prior to starting at Hallmark. And I think that helped a lot because we don't just have paper-based records. We have objects in the collection, um, just so many different types of materials. So having a well-rounded background was probably more helpful than having the preferred degree. Um, yeah, I'll basically echo that for the history degree. Um, I don't have a history degree. Um, I, I know a lot of archivists don't have a history degree. Um, my background is in music performance, of all things. Um, and then I went to library school. Um, but uh, there's not really a need for being a historian to be an archivist. The two jobs are really quite different. One is really more around arranging and describing materials and pre preserving them and providing access to them. And one is about kind of researching into the past and kind of rediscovering stories and telling them uh, in some way. Um, I, no offense to any historians in the room, but I've found that historians actually sometimes make kind of poor archivists. They can, <laughs> can get very bogged down in the stories, which is entertaining, but um, there's a lot, um, a lot going on in the archives and um, I think that's where library science really is focusing on kind of information organization and management and that can be really beneficial to the archives. Definitely there are jobs out there that are kind of archivist slash historian and then I think the story is probably a little bit different there. Yeah just like you were saying and a lot of university archivist positions can also be like university historian so that's definitely where something different comes in um, and I think even like uh, David was saying like He's in state archives, but it's also under the state historical society, right? So you probably, uh, the history might be more, uh, more helpful there. Yeah, I was just to piggyback back on your conversation. Um, the title historian and a lot of business archives is technically more of an archivist role. It's just many people in the company might not know what an archivist is but they'll use a the title, you know, historian or chief storytelling officer or collections manager is more general um, for a lot of uh, my uh, peers. Now, more and more frequently, though, um, they've been changing their job title roles internally to include archivist um, because more and more people know what an archivist does now. Um, but a lot of us do do both of those roles because we are looking at the archive as a use for branding, marketing, product. So we do want to pull those stories out. Um, but you would do both definitely in a business archive. I will say uh, you don't necessarily need to be back up that you don't need to be a, necessarily be a historian. I do have a history degree. But what comes with kind of that undergrad degree in research, you know, and a lot of us have it if we went to a liberal arts institution, is the ability to kind of remember things and retrace your steps. And I find uh, surprisingly a lot of archivists say they don't need a memory and they don't remember a lot of stuff. And I find to serve your researchers and your clientele and your employees, remembering where you were and where you've been and how you got there and how you can get there again quickly, not have to reinvent the wheel the whole time is really kind of the important thing. So if they tell you you don't need to remember anything, you know, or you, you know, I, I assume none of you are here in this category, but if you really can't remember anything, um, maybe archives or, yeah, I don't know. Because uh, I have seen, I've been around long enough to see people will reinvent the wheel and it really, it does help if you can stay organized and kind of remember where you were and get back there in a quicker fashion rather than having to reinvent that wheel. So whatever it takes to get there, doesn't have to be a history degree. You know, I would uh, add that um, having chaired a lot of search committees and served on a lot of search committees, in some cases, if, I mean, if the requirement says an MLS or, you know, an equivalent position, then that's important. But other than that, if you are able to tell me how you meet the other qualifications, if you have had a variety of other experiences, but you can tell me how you're going to take that experience and apply it to this job, 
then that's the important thing, right? I, as the, as the employer, I want to see that you've really thought about the job and what's going to be expected of you and that you're passionate and you're excited and you're gonna bring all of these skills and apply them in a unique way. So not necessarily the degree you have, but how you can promote yourself as the best candidate. If I may, um, Steve, you, 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 uh, wonder whether or not his, history degree is, is, is necessary to be an archivist. It's not, I, I'm, I'm lucky in that I can straddle the fence in that way, but you know, every day here, I use skills that I, I picked up, uh, working in the oil business for years, interpersonal skills, skills in reading balance sheets, skills in figuring out invoices and so forth skills in getting along with people as well as as well as some um, getting getting to know our clientele and figuring figuring out without without going through a reference inter, a full reference interview what they want um my historian skills i brought them to the job i will say i've done so little history since i took this job at least for myself because i've been helping other people to do theirs um I, so I, th I think at least um, acquaint acquaintance with what historians do is important, but coming into it with the desire to actually figure out the system and how to make it work for your patrons, for your employer, that's that probably trumps the, the formal history training for many of us. So it looks like Candace, Candace has a question. Pink, hi. Um, greetings, I am Candice and Patrice Owens. I am currently in the Arkansas cohort and it is my first year. Um, I am excited, nervous, and um, anticipating um, much change um, within the field right now. I am my, my question is, I just recently uh, did some research on archivists. Uh, in our past uh, course, we had to uh, do a presentation and one of the presentations was, my presentation was on, um, so you want to become an archivist. And in there, there was um, a lot of research provided on archival records moving to um, predominantly digital uh, records. And I, I just want to know, do you foresee that being um, the case? And if so, how would you um, say that uh, aspiring archivists uh, prepare for that particular uh, transition as far as maybe coursework, even, um, even in the workplace as well now and resources? Does my question make sense, please? Becky, I saw your head nodding. Do you want to take a crack at that one? Sure. So um, a lot of what I've been finding with our uh, clients and what seems to be you know, I mean, certainly the direction of the field is moving towards digital records and digital collecting and then managing those digital collections. That's just how it's going to be. Um, and just a need for understanding digital preservation and how to manage those collections and care for them is a huge need in the field. And that's a lot of what of the like the programs and webinars and courses that we're developing have to do with that. And actually, we just had our, our um, preservation services conference last week called Digital Directions, which is talking about how to manage this uh, transition. Actually, I shouldn't say transition in the field. It's going to be a, certainly a huge part of archives in the future and collections management. There's still going to be our physical collections to take care of always. Um, but the, it's just ha knowing, having that knowledge about digital preservation and digital collections is is really important and as far as like what courses to take anything you can about digital digital preservation um, I think is and just digital collections management um, and I also this is a little bit of a tangent but if you are a member of the Society of American Archivists pursuing like digital archive specialist training and things like that I think are going to be really helpful and important moving forward. Mm -hmm. I actually just put the link in the chat for the certificate. Okay. Thank you. How do you how do you propose that 
they're going to, I don't know how to ask my question. Let me, I'll think on it, meditate on it for a moment. While you're thinking, I can just pipe in as well. Um, digital records are not something that's like coming or something we're going to have to worry about. It's something that we're already dealing with. Like even in our physical collections, we have digital records going back to like the 80s, the 70s, um, things that might be accessible now, but most likely aren't. Um, so getting those off of media and moving on to servers is something that we're dealing with. I'm sure Becky gets quite a bit of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, for the vast majority of things, like now everything is created digitally. So the original record is digital. If you print that out, that's not even the original record. Um, so pretty much every archivist is having to figure out how to deal with that. And there are systems in place that can really help you out. Um, and some of them are quite pricey and some of them are not. Um, so it, a lot of it really depends on like where you work and what your resources are. Like I imagine the city and state archivists <laughs> hopefully are better than like where I am where we don't really have much, uh, you know, I work with like Java based tools that are very uh, basic and just try to keep everything together. Um, but there are like entire systems that work with records management together. Um, and those are really cool. Um, as far as training, I was actually just emailing Lisa yes, yesterday about this. Uh, there's a digital curation course next, hopefully next summer um, in the SLIM program that I would definitely recommend you take. There's um, another one around digital preservation, but I think it's a little bit more digital libraries than digital archives. Um, and as I said, the DOS, the Digital Archives Specialist Program, which I took, I think it's gotten better. <laughs> Three or four years ago, I would not actually recommend you do it. I would just recommend you read a lot of articles, um, but I know they've been retooling some of the education to make it a lot more um, I guess, interactive <laughs> and actually learning some things rather than just reading. Um, so that's something to look into. There are also um, Digital Power, which is P-O-W-W-R. I forget what the acronym is. Um, anyway, it's a program that was grant funded um, and designed for like smaller institutions or kind of community archives to get a handle on their, I can look up the link in a moment and put it in. Um, but get a handle on their digital records. So that's a really good thing to look into if you're kind of just wanting to get the basics for maybe dealing with your own digital records or if you find yourself in a smaller organization without a lot of resources. So I just wanna do a time check real quick. It's like two minutes to the hour. And I know while there is still light in the sky here in Portland, for those of you who are on the East Coast, it's like almost nine o'clock. So I just wanna respect your time. We can. We can leave this Zoom room open for a little while longer. I know we've got a lot of unanswered questions in the chat, um, but if you need to um, to depart, um, please feel free to do that. We really thank you for your time. Um, but you know, if you're willing to stick around, that's great. Um, we'll see if we can get some more of these questions answered. But again, if you need to leave, it's really been a pleasure to have you here with us. Um, and I really appreciate it. I know the rest of the directors do as well. Um, so David, were there some other questions you want to look at in the chat? Yeah, let me, uh, I'll throw out another one. Um, this one's from Shatine, who I, I think had to leave early, but she said she would be revisiting the uh, recording. So hi Shatine, <laughs> and let's get your question answered. Um, she's wondering if there's anything you do in your position that might not be typical of the archive profession. That's a fun one. Well, I've already touched a little bit on this, but I was under the assumption when I came into an archive that I would be cataloging and processing the materials, maybe scanning them and making them available digitally. And I do that. Um, and I also you know, accept donations and help um, records be transferred through our retention schedule to get here. Um, but my role has become so much more over the years as I became more and more well known in my company, more and more requests started coming in, of course, but I've basically become a museum curator, an exhibit designer, um, 
recording oral history interviews. So, you know, I, I, I'm a public speaker. I you know, do presentations and lectures and workshops. And so it's become much more varied, which I actually really enjoy. Uh, every day is a little bit different. Um, but then also working for a company, I'm helping with product, like on the store shelves, you'll see something that's vintage inspired, and that's directly from the archives. And my hand was on that, whether it was scanning something that was inspirational, um, or if that was sharing a story with an artist or writer to help with the packaging, or helping with the marketing materials and helping with press releases and website design. Um, so it's definitely become a like jack of all trades position uh, in my role and not a lot of things I would have thought about. I also didn't really think that I would be a loan arranger. Um, a lot of the other people on this call mentioned that they have other people in their departments to help out. Uh, and you'll find in smaller organizations, especially uh, nonprofits that maybe only have one or two people, you really do um, become a jack of all trades. And similarly in business arch archives, I do see a lot of businesses hiring archivists. Um, more and more are opening up archives because they see the need for storytelling, but they do tend to be much smaller. Uh, so you might have large collections, but you might only have one individual. So it's definitely been a unique job. I've been there almost 10 years now, um, and, and I love it. Uh, but it, it does make me think about, you know, trying to do additional training for things I never really would have thought about. So I do always look for webinars and YouTube videos and things if I don't already have the skills for those areas. Um, I definitely agree with the jack of all trades thing. Um, I think my like real comfort zone is in processing archival collections. Um, in my current position, I don't really get to do that anymore, especially with the interim um, director thing going on. But like when I came into this job, I think I had to learn something about rare books. I didn't know anything about rare books. I still don't really know much about rare books. I always am like, that's a library thing. Um, and then I'm sure you can imagine having an artifact collection in a medical uh, school that I've run into some very strange things. So like, I didn't imagine that I would be handling cocaine and heroin from the early 1900s or a radioactive water jug or a fetus, asbestos tiles. These are things that I was definitely not prepared for, especially from library school. Um, so you definitely have to kind of enter every situation with an open mind and um, good communication skills because you can't, I mean, you can be like a jack of all trades, but you're gonna have to get help from people um, or at least educated educated by other people. And so you're gonna need to um, be able to like communicate with a lot of different people. I see other heads nodding. Anybody wanna to add to that? Oh, there's a lot of focus on um, diversity, especially with big organizations these days. And uh, for me, I'm, I'm on the our office wide, we report to the city auditor, I'm on the office wide diversity, one of the, our diversity committees. So if you're in a larger organization, you may be pulled to do a variety of things that are outside of the archives. Um, diversity shouldn't be outside of anybody's archives anyway, but it's a, an office focus for us too. So um, I'm focusing more on that office wide in this case, um, part of it. So it's more the bigger, bigger picture than just outside the archive. So if you're in those, you're not a lone ranger and you're in those bigger organizations, uh, anything could come your way that way. So, you know, flexibility and ability to um, work in with teams that aren't just in the archives is always a plus. Something I, I said in a, uh, a private to um, Samantha, um, I, I know something about the Lone, Ra the Lone Ranger, the, Lone, the um, person behind the eight ball feeling because within a few weeks after I started here, everybody else had to go home. I was the only essential personnel 
And so for three months, I was the state archives. I was the face, I was the chief cook and bottle washer, and I washed the dishes too. And A, I was never so happy in my life as to see my people coming back after they decided we could open up again. And B, it had given me a chance to figure out a little bit about all their jobs. Um, I thought I was a jack of all trades before I came in here. Um, and I had, I had to stretch in those three months trying to co cover all the bases a little bit. And for a historian who'd gotten set in his ways, it was, it was a welcome dose of adult education. Let's see, David, do we have some other, um, maybe one more question from the chat? Yeah, um, again, just to honor the order in which they came in, um, Alyssa was wondering, what would you suggest to help new MLS graduates get a job in an archive? Do you have any thoughts on the competitive nature of the job market currently and in the future? Yeah. Um, so I would recommend looking at job postings, seeing what is being asked for, what the requirements are, and what the um, kind of preferred qualifications are and applying to as many of them that you feel like you meet say most or many of those qualifications. Uh, and just writing a really specific strong cover letter for that position. Because on the other side, as we are reading sometimes hundreds of cover letters, it's the ones where people have really taken time to talk about the institution, to look up maybe what collections they have or um, what their initiatives are, you know, those are the ones that are gonna stand out. So even if you don't have one or two things that they're looking for in their job posting, still apply um, and apply as much as you can because the more irons that you have in the fire, the more likely it is that you're going to get calls for phone interviews and well, probably not an in-person interview right now, but maybe a Zoom interview. Um, so I would say, you know, be confident, be confident in your skills, be confident in, you know, why you're applying for the position um, and just apply as many places as you can. I'm not an archivist, but this is a question I get from a lot of my MLS students. Uh, more generally, and uh, it's a cliche, but you're not scoring points if you're not taking a shot. You're not catching fish if your line's not in the water. Don't be the one to exclude yourself from a job search just by reading the job description and thinking that, well, I don't do that, 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 and that. I'm not going to apply. Yes, but you do this, 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 and this, and maybe you, like uh, Samantha said, you're, or Ashley said, you're going to write that letter that really stands out and then you get that face-to-face -face interaction and can convince them that you're the right person for the job. So let search committees exclude you. Don't exclude yourself because you're just not doing yourself a favor by doing that. I would say, actually Brian, you have something to say, right? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, to back up what Ashley said, you know, to definitely answer the question. Don't be a politician and answer the questions you wish they asked but definitely answer the questions that are on the application or, or the things they say, oh, you need, you know, even if it's not, you don't have archival specific uh, experience, you know, you might have it in something else. I mean, customer service is a big thing. So if you've done retail, you've done customer service and you need to highlight that. So definitely answer those questions they've, uh, they've put on there and don't, don't kind of not because you will, in our institution, you definitely need to answer those. Um, and yes, Candace, it's it's competitive. We tend to get for any open position in our up and down the scale. Uh, and when we have an open position, we tend to get 150 to 200 um, applications, and generally tend to get four to six PhDs. Um, so, yeah, it's competitive. Yeah, I was actually just going to say similar to Brian and even what David mentioned earlier is make sure that you look at the experience you have 
that might not specifically be archives or libraries, but talk about how it can relate to the job that they're asking me for. You know, um, as I mentioned, I have a music performance background, so I talk a lot about in, in my early job uh, applications, I talk a lot about um, communicating and working uh, in groups um, and things like that, being able to deal with difficult people um, and such. Um, and definitely, as you say, customer service, a lot of people have um, worked in food service or any kind of retail position, like those are skills that come in really handy. Um, but I'd say also you really want to use whatever resources you have at your disposal. So if you're, you know, if you have uh, a manager or something that you can talk to about jobs that you're applying to, definitely do that. Ask if they can review your cover letters or your resume if they have time. You could reach out to a professor if you have, if you take an archives courses, you know, depending on what job you're applying for, this can go for pretty much any job, but reach out to someone who's you know, willing to review things for you and give you some feedback. Um, it's really great if you can ever do like pra practice uh, interviews, um, especially if you're looking at, um, this might be a little bit further down the line, but if you're looking at academic jobs, those interviews are crazy. They last like a day, sometimes a day and a half. You have to give a presentation to people. Um, so that's something you really need to kind of like practice and get used to. Um, but don't be afraid to ask people to help you out however they can. Um, and there are a lot of people out there that are willing to do that because they've been in that same position, some of us not even that long ago, um, or, you know, I mean, I think I've, I've been, I graduated in 2013. So it's been about seven years um, since I graduated, about six years that I've been working kind of full time in archives. Um, but you know, I, when I was a student and before I got my first job, I think I, I probably applied to 80 or 100 different jobs. Just on the off chance, I think I got three interviews and the one job that I got was in Alaska. So good luck. <laughs> I also applied for a lot of jobs and I'm sure many of us have as well. Um, and what really helped me was networking and joining professional organizations as a student member. Um, so those generally are lower costs than a full membership. So Society of American Archivists, the American Alliance of Museums, and much more, especially local ones. Those tend to be a lot cheaper. Um, I became a member of the Kansas City Area Archivists um, before I even really thought about entering archives. I was just looking at archives, libraries, museums, et cetera. Um, and it was helpful because it gave me the opportunity to connect with other people locally. Obviously now a lot of those are via Zoom, um, but it allowed me to kind of get my feelers out there of what jobs were coming open um, and to share, as uh, Steve was just mentioning, my resume with others for them to, you know, give me some feedback on what I could improve on it. So networking and joining those professional organizations to not only meet people, but to also, you know, take part in webinars or other professional development opportunities to keep those skills fresh while you're applying, um, I think is definitely helpful. It's just to throw some resources out there too. So SAA has a mentoring program and I served on the mentoring subcommittee and I don't think you actually need to be a member. Like we don't check that you're a member. <laughs> um, so definitely look into that. You get paired with another archivist and you can mention what your area of interests are, what you would like to talk about, um, and they will pair you for a year. So that's a great resource. SAA um, will likely be at least partially virtual next year. Um, and they have a career center every year. So you can sign up to meet with somebody to review your resume or to practice interviewing or to talk about career advice. Um, I mean, and, and we are also resources, right? So if you want to reach out to any of your professors, I know I'm always happy to, to talk more and answer questions as well. My, my wife, who is a, a former librarian turned presidential archivist turned back to librarian, go figure that one, um, back when I was looking for work as an historian and, and tossing out dozens of applications. And oddly enough, Steve, one I, one I got was um, offered was up in Alaska too. Didn't take that one, but she, but she figured out that I was getting a bad, a bad case of owly 
uh, doing the applications. And she reminded me, A, if I can do 40% of the, of, the, of the tasks they call for in the advertisement, apply for it, because chances are the other 60 can't be that much harder. And B, everything that I had done to that point, that there was some way to apply the skills I'd learned um, to the tasks, to the duties they were advertising, that was a prospect. But what somebody said about joining professional associations, organizations, going to meetings, getting to know these people, you stop thinking of yourself as an outsider who wants to get in. You, st you start thinking of yourself and representing yourself in your beta, in your cover letters, in your application documents, as somebody who's in and you're looking to, you're, you're looking to move up. And it's, it's a difference that I see when I, when I read application letters. Um, and it's, it's, it's an impressive shift in self-image, which translates into the image that those of us who are looking at your Vita will see too. That's a really great point. That's one of the things that I actually find when I review student um, cover letters, especially is like, stop apologizing for what qualifications you don't have and focus just on the qualifications you do have. <laughs> Sell yourself. And if you're thinking imposter syndrome, like literally everyone in this profession has imposter syndrome about something. Um, so just uh, focus on your strengths and know that you're probably better than you think you are. Yeah, and I would echo what other people have said. Join those local, especially. I mean, the local organizations, you'll get to know people uh, in the local area. SAA is great, but, you know, it's, it's huge, and chances are it's not going to benefit you as much. So those, yeah, we have a Portland area archivist. We have a Northwest archivist in this area. And get to know them and maybe volunteer for things like the archives crawl or things that are in your area. Um, because people hire people, and if those people recognize your name and know your face because you've been out there to some degree, uh, that helps. That might be a great place to stop. I love it when I have outside speakers validate the things that I've been saying to my students. Um, so I know we have a lot of unanswered questions in the chat. We'll grab those and, and see if we can get them answered for you. Um, again, thank you to all of our guest archivists who've joined us tonight. Really appreciate your time and your experience. Yep, clap. You can use your applause button. <laughs> um, and um, thank you all for coming. I don't think I have anything else to say. Um, the sky is almost dark now, so it's a good time to stop. <laughs> Until we meet again. Exactly. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Thank you. Samantha, I've got some ideas on Hallmark movie plot points if you ever need any help with that. <laughs> Feel free to shoot me an email. That's actually <laughs> something that I didn't mention, but if you ever see vintage greeting cards in the films, those are all from the archives. Nice. My wife and I, I will say, we watch some Hallmark movies. It happens. Well, it's yeah. countdown to Christmas, so. <laughs> all right, take care, all. Thanks, bye. Bye, bye all. Thank you, all. Thank you.